All right. There we go. All right, great. Um, let's get started. So, um, the, uh, the, the presentations, uh, many of you have signed up for presentation times now, but there are still, I don't think there's anyone signed up for this week. Um, I haven't actually done the check of who has and hasn't signed up, but I, what? Yeah, right. But everybody has to sign up, so if you haven't signed up, please uh, think about something you can do this week. Um, that would be good, otherwise we're going to sort of run out of time, which would not be good. Um, and, you know, anything, like, I hope, I hope we've given the idea that it, you know, it doesn't have to be super deep or um, formal. And so, you know, it could be something like if you just wanted to follow on with one of the practicals we've done or something like that. Because I feel like we, we don't get a lot of, we don't really manage to spend as much time as would perhaps be useful talking about that. So anything, anything like that that you want to do, please, uh, please step up. Okay, uh, any other questions about, oh, midterm evaluations. So I, you're probably hearing about this in your other classes. There's an online evaluation system. And I'm not exactly sure when it opens. I, it hasn't been enabled for this class yet, but I would, I would be very interested in getting your feedback on you know, the different parts, the different things we're doing. So that'll be uh, online sometime soon. And uh, please do take advantage of that to give me some information about you know, how things are working and how things could be improved. Anything else? OK. So this week, um, we're talking about linear predictive kinetics. Okay. We're talking about linear predictive coding, and this is another um, system for modeling sounds, which is particularly. Which is particularly useful for, um, for 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 voice, for human voice, but also a lot of um, different kinds of acoustic sources, and um, it's a very simple system. It's been around for a long time. It was the basis of the speech synthesizer, you know, the earliest uh, consumer speech synthesis tools that to impl applications, the speak and spell, the, the text instrument speak and spell, which was this little thing that you know generated synthesized voice, and it's it's the, it's the key ingredient of most speech synthesis and coding algorithms just because it's such a good fit. But the, the, the essence of it is that it just models individual resonances, simple, you know, standard, second order, single pole resonances, and that that is a very good match for a lot of acoustic systems. So we'll start off talking about resonance and then this idea of breaking a, a sound into source and filter, the source filter model. Then we'll talk about linear predictive, linear prediction or linear predictive coding, the, the, the basic math, a few different representations, and then we'll look at how we can actually do synthesis and to some extent modification in this domain. Okay, come back. All right. So, um, this idea of resonance is very important and kind of um, central to a lot of acoustics and other physical systems. And it's actually a very intuitive idea, or at least we've all had experiences of it which are quite sort of visceral and different from the mathematical representations. And so the one, I, one way of illustrating it is this idea of, the, uh, of a, a child's swing that when you're on a swing, it's a, basically a pendulum. And so, you know, the motion here, ignoring the sort of second order effects, is basically sinusoidal oscillation, right? And you're, you're converting the energy of the system between kinetic energy in the swing to potential energy at the, at the extremes. But the reason that this is, and, but, and the, the frequency that you swing at is the resonant frequency of that, of that system, of that pendulum. The reason this is interesting is because of the, the experience of 
of building up the swinging in a swing, right? That you, when you're on a swing, you do something. You either kick the ground or you move your body. And that puts a little bit of energy into the system. But you don't do it in this smooth sinusoidal way. You do it in a kind of more um, limp, local, like you put in a, a pulse of energy regularly. But because, and so the system could respond in different ways to that pulse of energy. But because the system has this natural mode, this natural mode of oscillation at this particular frequency, what gets left is this sinusoidal um, motion. And whatever energy you put in that has a, a Fourier component of this frequency, that's what builds this up. And everything else kind of dies out, or the amplitude doesn't build up. And that's kind of the, the essential insight of resonance, which is that there's it's this, a system, and you know, it's a mechanical system, so you, the, the parts could move in any trajectory. But it has this um, very sort of low cost, high gain response at a particular frequency, the resonant frequency. So you put in energy of sort of any, any kind of composition, any spectrum, what's going to happen most often is you're going to get this particular frequency coming out, this particular motion at, at the resonant frequency. So this is you know, you could view this as what's been happening in something like the plug string. The plug string had multiple resonances, but they, you know, they pick, you took a broadband excitation and ended up with these particular sinusoidal excitation, sinusoidal responses. Um, you know, a drum head is another natural or any kind of, any kind of reasonably rigid mechanical system has resonances like this. A room, you know, the room has various frequency peaks and they can be treated as resonances, as poles. And then the vocal tract, basically, you know, what the voice is, is this oscillator, the, these flapping folds, but then the throat is this kind of, the throat and the mouth is this reconfigurable acoustic chamber where what we do is we move resonances around to make different, different sounds out of our voices. And so in in digital or in linear system, in signal processing speak, a resonance is just a pole. And uh, we know how to build those pretty easily. The, the poles are pretty cheap, pretty easy to put together. And this is, you know, in, in a, at a, depending on how you think about implementing your pole, right, in a, in a digital filter, a pole is feedback with a certain amount of gain. And that, that's sort of, you begin to see why that is the same as these resonance systems, that the, the feedback with a particular game is not like different ways of building it, but, you know, essentially there's going to be some frequency which it just reinforces, and that's, that's the resonant frequency. So that's the, uh, the idea that we're, we're dealing with resonances, and they're kind of ubiquitous mechanically. I mean, you know, they're very important in all kinds of mechanical systems like... I don't know when I was doing this, it was uh, all about the, the, the resonant frequencies and damping of like wheels on cars because they have a mass, they have a spring, and you want them not to resonate, not to, not to ring. But they're all over the place. And um, here's the, the simple, the simplest discrete time implementation of uh, a resonance, which is a second order system. And that means it has, its second order feedback system has two poles in a, in conjugate, a conjugate uh, pair like this. And so if the coefficients here are negative r squared and 2r cosine omega c, then this is where you get the poles. The poles are at radius r and angle omega c and the conjugate of that. And then if, you know, from what we remember about how we do this in in uh, discrete time signal processing, the frequency response is the value of this z function on the unit circle. So if we have a pole, pole is where the magnitude goes to infinity. If we have the pole close to the unit circle, then we have a peak in the frequency response here. So the frequency response of this system looks like this. It's, you know, it's got some normal value, and then it has this peak value in this case where we have a pole close to the inner circle where when, that, when the z equals e to the j omega c gets close to that. So this is a bandpass filter.
has a center frequency which is approximately the angle here. When, it's, when the hole is close to the inner circle, it's, it's pretty much exactly that angle. It has a bandwidth which is related to the distance between the pole and the inner circle. As that distance gets larger, the bandwidth gets broader. And so we often talk about the Q factor of a band, of a band pass filter like this, which is the ratio of the center frequency to the bandwidth. Because in some sense, you know, the bandwidth is only interesting as a proportion of the center frequency. So that's the Q. And a, a high Q filter has a small bandwidth, meaning, meaning it's got a very narrow range of frequencies. This is the behavior in the time domain, classic behavior in the time domain, in, which I've plotted in MATLAB. And you can just see the MATLAB code down here. I've just created a couple of, um, I've created this, these poles here, and then run filter and an impulse through filter. And this is with a Q of 10. And you see, you know, whatever the, whatever the sampling rate is, this is what a Q of 10 looks like. That the Q is basically how quickly the amplitude dies away in terms of the oscillations, the center frequency. So Q of 10, you know, very roughly speaking, by 10 cycles, it'll sort of die away. Q of 2 would die away much more quickly. So that's, uh, that's what we're talking about. Um, let me just see if we can listen to this. So, because that's, you know, looks fine, and, um, you know, if we think about the, chi the swing or the pendulum, that all makes sense. Yes, that's kind of what we think a, a plot of a pendulum's motion against time would look like. And then in, in the pendulum's case, the Q uh, is related to the loss, right, that if you have, or the damping. If you have a system, some kind of, you know, oscillating system that's very, very, has very little damping, then it'll keep oscillating, it'll decay away very slowly. But if you have something where there's some friction or air resistance, then it'll die away more quickly. But acoustically, this all is the same thing, but uh, it has a particular sound. So let's see if we can just hear that sound. So um, this is a little PD patch. And uh, what it does is it just it uses this this PD element BP, which is a bandpass filter, but it turns out it's a bandpass filter influenced exactly like this, which just as a single pair of poles, and has inputs, the center frequency, and the Q. And um, what I'm doing here is I'm just going to put an impulse into this, so it's the same things we were doing in, uh, in that little MATLAB, piece of MATLAB, and um, then we can see if we can see what it's doing here with these um, processing patches. Let's see if we can see this now. So I've, uh, I've got it so that this impulse, this, this is the, a table, a lookup table, which has got just a single impulse in it. So when I press a key or when I click this button, this impulse comes out and then goes into the bandpass filter. So uh, if I turn up the gain here, so you hear the like little pop sound, and you can see here's the output of the oscilloscope, which is exactly what we saw before. It's just the sinusoid dying away. But can you hear the sound? It sounds, what does it sound like? It sounds like a little bubble popping or something. So if I change the frequency of this, right, it sounds like something like that. And then if I change the Q, as the Q goes down, it becomes increasingly broadband. I can't even see that in this oscilloscope, it's too fast. And as the Q goes up, it's quieter because of the way the filter is structured, but it, can you hear that? Maybe I need to put a gain in here. Hmm. It's not going to work. Times twiddle. 
it sounds more like um, a, a string or some kind of you know musical resonance being struck. It sounds like a classic early computer music drum sound, which is not very convincing, but but all it is, you know, it's just a sinusoid with a exponentially decaying envelope. But as the uh, envelope becomes faster and faster, then the quality of it changes. So that, the point about that was just, you know, to make the point that there is this sort of perceptual correlate of these of these expon of these resonances, and it's very kind of familiar, but it's just not necessarily we don't necessarily make the connection with uh, with the math. If we look at the spectrum here. Um, yeah. Hey. So you can see, the, you know, we've got the same decaying sine waveform here, but here's the actual spectrum popping up, and it's like a little. We move the frequency. You know, it moves around in frequency, and it, but it's this little peak, and then if we change the Q, as it gets higher Q, it gets narrower and narrower. As it gets lower and lower Q, this thing becomes broader. Yeah. And so that kind of makes sense. And then if we look at the actual, um, oops, look at it in the spectrogram, Um, right. You know, it looks very much the same as we'd expect. But now, rather than exciting it with no, with an impulse, we can turn on noise excitation, which just feeds a constant signal in. But again, just to analyze, just look at what this filter is doing. And uh, on the spectrum, we see you know this. Noise exciting, uh, noise excitation of the the spectrogram. Okay, let me just see. Well, I guess you can see the the you can see what's going on with the filter here. So again, if I move the if I move the center frequency around, you see the the shape stretching as I move the Q. You see just the the width of the filter changing, and then you can't. You can't see this, but I mean, obviously, the spectrogram is just this sort of, you know, rendering this against time. And so, as you move the, uh, <coughs> as you change the Q, it becomes more kind of focused. And as you move the frequency around, there's a center frequency which moves. Okay. So that is uh, that's what we're dealing with. That's what that's what. Resonances are um, acoustically to listen to. Okay. As so I said, that um, the, one of the reasons that LPC or linear, you know, these kind of all-pole models are so important is because. Um, they're a good match to the vocal tract. And so here's a spectrogram of some voice. And it's a wideband spectrogram. So we're seeing kind of, you know, this... We're not seeing the individual harmonics. We're sort of seeing the uh, frequency structure on a shorter time scale, a broader frequency scale. And so these, these vertical stripes, the individual pitch pulses. But what we see under these individual pitch pulses is these sort of... These resonances, these, these peaks in the spectrum... And then they move around, and that's what that's what give that's what conveys most speech sounds. But so this is has has a watch, right? So has the air sound is a, these formats moving like this, and then the a watch the a w is this yeah is this sort of low freak you know this 
uh, moving towards these lower, lower resonances and then the, the resonance is opening up as the, as the wa comes out. A wa is a, a liquid, which means it's primarily defined by the changes in, in the resonances like this. So some of the sounds like ch are differences in excitation, the, the noise, the ch sound rather than the er sound. But even those, there's a difference between ch and sh. Mm, no, there isn't. There's a difference between ch and s, which is also based on resonances in, in diff different resonances, giving you a different spectrum. So in, in speech, the resonances are called formants. And they come from moving the tongue around, so you have different sort of constrictions and and cavities in, in, the, in the mouth and throat which have different resonant frequencies. But that's, that's how the system works and that's how we carry information on, in our voices. So um, this leads to this idea of modeling these signals and other signals with, this, with the source filter model. And this is very much inspired by the vocal tract. So you have um, a source, some kind of excitation, some broadband uh, signal. And for voice or for a speech synthesis model, it's either going to be a periodic signal, which is standing for the, uh, the periodic vibrations of the vocal folds. What actually happens with the vocal folds is that you know, air comes through and they snap together. And so you get these rapid uh, terminations of the, of the airflow, which is like the impulse, which gives you this broadband periodic energy. Or it's uh, broadband noise. And in the vocal tract, that's formed by making a constriction so that suddenly the airflow becomes turbulent, which means it has a lot of sort of un unstructured energy, like the sound like when you go s, it's the, it's the gap between your, your tongue and top of the mouth. And when the air goes through there, it just has this turbulent regime, which gives you the, 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 the broadband noise. So you have this excitation, which is either periodic or noise, or actually a combination of the two. So if you make a sound like zzzz, that's a combination of noise and, uh, and, and periodic excitation. But then you have this resonant filter, this vocal tract filter, which is well modeled as just a, a concatenation of several, a set of several, a set of poles, a set of resonances. And then there's some other sort of fixed uh, filtering, which happens just from you know the the sound coming out of your mouth and going into space, the radiation load. But uh, this is the start part. These are the parts that's interesting because these are the parts that you change in time, and that as listeners we're very sensitive to these changes, partly because we've evolved to be good at understanding speech, and partly because one can argue that just this is something that's very ubiquitous in physical systems, so it's useful. For all, it's useful to be able to pick out these resonances because they tell you about the physical structure of where the sound came from. So this is the basic source filter model, and it has a number of advantages. Um, it's, it's a good match to, to real-world sounds, particularly voice. It has this nice way of breaking, breaking down the sound into a set of parameters, you know, the parameters of the excitation, the parameters of the filter, which are perceptually salient, that when we listen to a sound, we sort of perceive the excitation and the filter structure separately. We're quite, the brain is pulling them apart. So it's nice to have them be separate, um, separate parameters to the, to the synthesis, to the method we're using to generate sound. And of course, the, uh, another big advantage is that it's computationally very efficient. A filter, a resonant filter, like we saw a single pair of poles, requires just two feedback, so two multiplies and adds in a discrete time system, and we can add more poles for the same price. So it's, rel it's very, it's more or less the cheapest thing we could do. So linear prediction is how we're going to do it. It's normally called LPC for linear predictive coding because it was a, a lot of the uh, early uses of it were in, in coding, in taking a signal and compressing it into a, into a representation for transmission. But it's just, it's just a way of, of modeling a signal. Coding is only one application. In terms of coding, the goal is to 
remove redundancy in a signal, that you want to express it with less, with fewer parameters, so that if there's redundant information in the original signal, you sort of try and bring that out. And so one way of, one sort of principle of trying to do that is saying, well, if, if there's redundancy in the signal, that means that I, I can tell something about the future signals, future samples of signal from the past samples. And so if I try and, if I build a system that tries to do that prediction, then I only have to transmit the differences between what you could already predict and what actually the true signal is. So linear prediction is saying, well, what's the simplest model I could take for predicting the future samples from the past samples? That would be a linear model. And so I'm taking my signal, S of n, and I'm saying, well, I wonder how well I can match S of n as a sum of some previous samples, like up to p preceding samples, with fixed linear coefficients applied to each of these. And then, well, I'm not going to do a perfect job predicting that, so I'll have this residual, this error signal here as the remainder. When you sort of think of it just like that, as the idea of predicting, a sig predicting some future of a signal as a linear combination of its past components, I don't know about you, but for me, that sort of suggests that you could have maybe a trend, but it's not, it's not so intuitive that this actually you can get sinusoidal oscillations. But when you think about this as a, a feedback filter, which is, of course, all it is, it's saying that, you know, this is, this is an IIR filter. The current output is some of the past outputs delayed, and then with linear, with constant gain terms. We know that this is an all-pole structure which can indeed give us decaying resonances, de oh, decaying exponentials. Yeah. EN, EN in, that, in that interpretation, EN is the input, right? So this is the output part of the filter, which is just the FIR. EN is the uh, input, X of N. In, in the coding in, in the coding view, it's like, I've got an actual S of N. I'm going to try and predict it in terms of linear combination of its previous inputs, which won't quite work. So this is the, the deviation from the prediction, which is the, the part you have to transmit, the part you can't, the, the non-redundant part. This, this part is redundant because I can predict it from the previous part. This part is the, the, the innovation, the new part. And then from a, from a sort of a modeling point of view, this is just error. This is like you're going to do this best, your best job of modeling something, but you have some error term left over. And so typically when you're trying to fit a model, you, if you're trying to say, I want this, I've got the signal, I've got this sort of model I want to fit to it, how can I set these parameters? You set up an equation like this, but this isn't quite equality because you're not going to get a perfect fit. So you put the error on the end to say, okay, now it's exactly equal, and whatever I don't accommodate here, I'm going to put into here. And then you manipulate this equation to say, but I want to put as little as possible into here. And so typically what you do is you say, well, um, if I square this, I take the magnitude of this, and then take the, the differentiated with respect to the coefficients, then solve for that. That gives me the coefficients that minimize the energy in the residual, which is how you find the, the least squares optimal predictor of this. Exactly. So this is, um, this is a lot like um, that kind of neural network in that we have an output which is the sum of some inputs with different coefficients and we're, in, we're going to want to try and learn these coefficients somehow. And then we're not going to, you know, well, we can only approximate to some extent so we've got this error term. Um, the difference being that neural networks, it's a nonlinear function. So actually you take the sum of the weights and the inputs and then you put it through a nonlinearity here. And the the impact of that is, it turns out that the thing I just described, of taking the square of this and taking the derivative, is closed form. We can actually solve it just by you know, solving some linear equations. We can find the AKs. Once you put nonlinearity into it, it ceases to become closed form. And so what, what you can do is do gradient descent, where you look at the, the, the rate of change of the error with the different coefficients, and then you try and move them in the direction that reduces error, and eventually you get some local optimum.
but that's a lot more expensive because you have to do it iteratively rather than just solving it once and getting the right, right answer. Um, but yeah, it's the, same, it's the same setup. So in this equation, we've got our AKs, which are called the linear predictor coefficients. And it's called pth order because we're using p <coughs> previous samples, right? As n moves on, the actual set of samples that were previous samples we're using always moves on with it. So it's just the most recent p ones. But we only, we only look back p samples into the past. And then we always take the same set of coefficients and apply them. And p is normally pretty low, right? So uh, again, viewing this as an IIR filter, this is p is the order of the filter. And which means the number of poles that the filter has. Well, the poles are going to come in pairs. But for every two resonances, we're going to be able to get one spectral peak. And so, you know, for a voice synthesis, you get pretty good synthesis with three or four spectral peaks. So we only need an order of like maybe eight here. And if we add more, we'll get more detail. But um, we, don't, we don't need a lot of coefficients here. And then EN is, you know, variously the residual, which we'll talk about in a second, or the innovation, meaning the part that wasn't linear, linearly predictable, or the, the input to the system. So you, taking the, 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 the DSP view, um, treating this as a, a linear system with S as output and E as input, we can take the Z transform and we can get the, the transfer function from E to S. And it's just this, if you rearrange it, it's one, minus, 1 over 1 minus this sum of a k z to the minus k. So we call this thing a of z, the denominator, the, the z transform of the, of the pole section. So it's just an all-pole filter. In statistics, this is called autoregressive because you're doing a regression, a, a, linear, a linear combination of things, but you're doing a regression of signal onto itself, so it's autoregressive. So you also see these things called AR models. So an, an eighth order linear predictive model is called an AR8 model. So, um, and then if you think about it in terms of this source filter model, it's just, it's, it's very, it's a very direct expression of this, that here's our output, here's our filter, and then here's our source, which is the input to our, to our filter. So, you know, we have whatever it is. If we, if we had some way of choosing these things to be what we wanted, then we could just have our excitation be whatever it is that we think the voice is doing either noise or some pulse train. We could take these AFKs and wrap them up into a, an all-pole filter A of Z like this, and we just feed that in, and we get S of N out. Um, it turns out that if you um, make a kind of a piecewise constant model piece of, the, of the actual vocal tracks treated as a, a set of tubes of constant, of low, you know, piecewise constant cross-section, which then have these sort of junctions, that acoustic system is an all-pole system, and you can figure out the poles based on the sizes and the lengths of the, the sections. Um, these things, of course, are not now constant for all time, the AKs, because the, the vocal tract is changing with time. But it changes quite slowly, right? Because actually, to change it, you've got to move these pieces of tissue around. And so on the scale of individual samples, you can treat it as, as locally constant and slowly changing. Yeah? Uh, is it a linear time environment causal system? We treat it as a locally linear time invariant causal system, yes. It's not time invariant, right? So actually, you know, because uh, as we saw in the spectrogram, the, the resonances move, so it's time varying. But on the scale of individual samples, right, you know, a few thousand samples per second, you can treat these parameters as constant. And then if you have them slowly varying, it, you know, the our tools are for assuming these things are constant. Um, but if you just, if you make sure that they only change slowly relative to the individual samples that are coming out, 
you don't you don't get bitten. It, it basically works. The analysis holds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the as the as that well. So the the number of coefficients we're encoding here, clearly, you know, that's the that's the information we're sending. So as we um, as we use fewer and fewer coefficients, we're sending less and less detail, and so we get less less stuff coming out. Yeah. And so it's both the number of coefficients and how often we update them, right? Because that, that, that product, if we send, you know, if we use 12 coefficients and we send it 50 times a second, you know, that's half as much as if we send it 100 times a second or whatever. So you have to tune that, those choices according to the actual structure of the signal. And so, and, and, you know, what you care about. So for voice, it turns out if you want to preserve intelligible speech, you want to make sure there are at least three or four resonances, pole pairs. So you don't want the order to go down below, say, eight. And it depends on the bandwidth. Because although you want to have a certain number of resonances, when you do LPC, you don't really get to choose where the resonances fall. It'll just find over the whole spectrum, it'll put down the resonances in order to get the best approximation of the spectrum. So depending on the bandwidth, you may need more poles than that to make sure you get the resonances that are really important for speech. That's how you choose the order here. And in order to get the, the, the right update rate, you have to figure out how rapidly those actually change. So you try it with actual speech and say, well, if I, if I update them you know, three times a second, is that enough to capture the dynamics of real speech? No, it isn't. And then you sort of move up from there. This is actually, I mean, LPC is the, is the foundation of all um, digital voice encoding schemes like the ones used in cell phones. And so that, that's been very highly optimized, right? That we, you know, when you're building a cell phone, you don't want to have to use more uh, radio bandwidth than you absolutely have to, but you want to optimize the, the speech quality. So there's been, a, you know, decades of uh, evolution of these algorithms. And I think, I think GSM, you know, this, the, the common standard uses a 20 millisecond frame. It updates the LPC, the, the filter coefficients every 20 milliseconds, but it interpolates them. It actually updates the, the values of the, the structure of the filter every five milliseconds, but actually, you know, based on the, the next frame that it got from the, uh, from, from the far end, something like that. Okay. So we get the idea of what the filter is now, that it's like it's these set of resonances, a uh, set of poles giving resonances, which are, for instance, the, the vocal track resonances. We still have the question of how we're going to find them. So here's, here's an actual you know, DFT of a slice of a piece of speech. The little individual pulses we see here are the harmonics of the speech, but these, these broad peaks here are the, the formant resonances that we'd like to model. So how do we, how do we choose our AKs to get those resonances out? Well, it's what we were saying before. If we had our model of S of, as S of n equal to a, a k S of n minus k plus E of n, if we rearrange it to get E of n on one side, and then if we square both sides, we get this, that the sum, and then sum it over time, the sum of E squared of n is equal to the sum of S of n minus the predictor, sum of 1 to P of a k S of n minus k, all squared. And then we can take this, this is now our total residual, you know, our total deviation energy. We can differentiate this with respect to the, the AKs and find the AKs that, that minimize, that, that give us zero in differential. And it turns out that's a nice convex problem. So the, there's, there's a unique solution, and it's the, the best solution. And if you do that, that's not very hard to do. And what you end up with is a set of equations which are actually um, functions of the autocorrelation of S, RSS, at different lags. And that's equal to, right, it's just that, that if you, that's what, that's the definition of RSS. And so you get these, uh, the A of Ks, each of the A of Ks 
defined in terms of these, uh, these autocorrelation coefficients. So here's, uh, and you know, if you look in any standard text, you'll see the actual derivation there, but it's pretty straightforward. So here's an example. Um, this is done in MATLAB, and I'll, I'll put the MATLAB diary of generating these up if you want to see it, just because it's, it's not that hard. So here's a little piece of uh, speech waveform that I took out of a real sample, and then um, I just put a handing window on top of it to make it you know, die away at the edges. So just look at the blue. Ignore the red for the moment. This um, blue spectrum here is just you know, the spectrum of that signal here plotted on a you know, the frequency axis up to 8,000 hertz. It's long enough, so actually this is period. You can't that clearly see the individual periods, but it turns out that these are individual pitch cycles. This speech is periodic, and so we do see these classic individual harmonics, and we also see these clear peaks coming from the resonances. So we calculate the autocorrelation of this signal. We solve for the, uh, the A of Ns that minimize the uh, residual. And we get this filter here. We get a bunch of poles coming out, giving us resonances. And then we can actually take this all-pole filter and plot its spectrum you know, just by calculating h of e to the j omega for this thing. And this is what you get. And so because we've only got, what have we got here? One, two, three, four. We've got 12 poles, six pole pairs here. This filter is not going to be that. It can't have anything like the level of structure of the individual, of the original signal, right? It can only have, it could have up to six local peaks. And they can look like these nice resonant peaks. They could be sharp. It turned out that the math, you know, which found the solution, which minimized the error, uh, sort of used them in a particular way, put them in a couple of pairs here to get these slightly broader peaks, and then put a couple up here just to get some peaks up here. But that's, you know, that's just what it, that's, turns out to be the right answer. What did that actually minimize? Well, yeah. Oh, I'm just very curious. So like, at a time equals zero, t equals zero, you know, n equals, n, n equals zero. So it, it, it requires to, it, maybe it requires the, uh, the value of the, the init, uh, initial value before the um, time yeah. equals zero. Yeah. So yeah. So um, in this solution, I wanted this to be zero at the edges, and then notionally I extended this with zeros at, in, in all time. So you know, the actual solution, you know, it is a, it's a forward predictor here, so it's looking at the past samples. But the contribution of this point is it's like, well, this point should be equal to these points back here times the predictor coefficients. These ones are all zero, so they're, they're implicitly zero. You can actually, because we're doing it for a windowed piece of the signal, you could imagine solving this problem and saying, okay, well, here, I'm, even though I'm only going to optimize it over this chunk of samples, right, there's the sum of n that I'm taking the error over, I could still say I'm going to calculate it based on the actual samples that did come before that. That gives you a different solution because it's different, it's similar, but now instead of being based on the autocorrelation, it's not, it's based on the actual particular uh, inner product of the signal against length of itself. It gives you a, um, a different solution, which in some cases is going to be more accurate because you avoid this windowing and this assumption of padding with zeros. But it has this nasty property that it can give you an unstable solution. It can actually give you a solution where the poles fall outside the inner circle. Because a pole outside the inner circle, we know that in general we don't like that. It means that a signal that's when you put an impulse into it, it keeps growing forever without bound. <coughs> but over this sing single, you know, this finite chunk of signal, it could be that this thing is, you know, a, a beautiful excerpt of an exponentially growing um, sinusoid, in which case it would be a very good fit to putting in a single impulse at the beginning and having a, a pole outside the inner circle, an unstable pole. That would exactly predict the signal over that, that uh, time window. There's nothing... Um, there's nothing violated in the sort of the setup of the problem where we try and linearly predict the, the signal over some time frame that says, and the sy system has to be stable. That's not, you know, that's not, that, you didn't, 
the math doesn't know that you're talking about a system. The math just says you're look, trying to predict some numbers from some other numbers in this hack. So that particular approach, which is called the covariance approach, is sometimes more accurate, but uh, it is more accurate, but it, gives you un it can give you unstable filters. This approach, which is called the autocorrelation approach, is not quite so accurate, but it, oh, it's guaranteed to give you stable filters. I'm not exactly sure how you guarantee that, but just because of the structure of this, you can see it's never going to look like a diverging exponential. So uh, that's, that's why we prefer it. OK, so the, the solution, we, the way we set up, yeah. Yes. But uh, in that way, uh, I wonder whether it can preserve the frequency information because you can see yeah. the blue line and the red line, the information of yeah. the frequency. Yeah. It's a little different. OK, let me talk about that for, for a second. So the, the question is, you can see here that this, this black line is a kind of smooth approximation to the blue line. right? It's, it's taken the blue spectrum. It's basically done this constrained thing where it tries to get the black line to be as close to the blue spectrum as possible, given the constraints that it's only the, f the function of moving these poles around. So it can't have a very detailed fit. It can only have these broad resonances. And it tries to do the best job. The best job here was in terms of the energy of the residual, the sum of E squared of n, by Parseval's relation, which is that the energy in the, s the time domain is the same as the energy in the frequency domain. That means that it's, it's also minimizing the energy of the, of the difference between these two things in the spectrum, although it's the linear difference, not the dB difference. And so this red line here is that difference thing, which is basically um, the blue line minus the black line, right? Yeah. And so that's the, the signal that we're trying to minimize. And, uh, but this is, we can also get this by taking these poles, turning them into zeros, that is, just flipping over our Z transform, and then filtering this signal with that inverse filter. And that gives us this thing here, which is also which is the signal that has this red spectrum here. And this is the residual signal. This is e, e of n. Once I solve this, I get my a, of, my a of n's, my a of k's, my a k's out. I then, I'm then saying that my original signal, x of n, is equal to this filter, 1 over a of z, times E of n, and this is E of n, the, sig the signal that when I filter it with this filter gives me this thing here. And this is the thing whose energy has been minimized over all possible filters of this order that when combined with some particular input would give me this. This is the filter and the signal that have the, the lowest energy to give me that output. And so this is the way that, because what the filter can do is boost particular frequencies, Right, that's what red, these, it can introduce these resonances, which will take this red signal and just boost up certain parts of it. The solution is always the signal that basically has, the residual is always the flattest version of this spectrum. That the filter takes out all local, the local broad shape and it just leaves you with this kind of flat part, which is the, the, uh, the part where we couldn't pull out any more broad, broad shape. And so it's making the signal, making this signal, which had this kind of nice structure, into this signal, which has this kind of flat structure, which is more like a white noise signal, which is why this process is called whitening, that you take, you take the LPC, it gives you the broad spectral shape, and you have what's left over, which is the, the fine structure in the spectrum, which is closest to white noise. And a white, the thing about a white noise signal is, it's, a, you know, white noise is an IID random number. That means that knowing the history of what the values were doesn't tell you anything about what the next value is because they're independently distributed. And so this whitening process turns this, uh, turns this signal more into something like white noise. But only up to the, the, uh, the level of the constraints that um, the, the filter can do. So let's just have a look at that in MATLAB because it's kind of interesting what happens. Um, so again, this is on the, uh, this is in the, um, 
MATLAB diary for, for this week. So we can take a signal, and um, it actually works. This is this this is a 16 kilohertz signal. Cottage cheese with chives is delicious. Okay. That's speech. It, 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 LPC, like I said, it's going to try and fit the whole bandwidth that you give it. It doesn't care about which which frequencies are which. So, but perceptually, the lower frequency is more important. So, in order to um, focus on that, we're going to downsample this to eight kilohertz. It sounds kind of the same. Cottage cheese with jazz is delicious. Okay. Now, what I have here is this function LPC fit. What it does is it breaks it. Um, it breaks signal up into short time regions, you know, short time windows, and then for each one, it'll fit, um, do an LPC solution just like that. So, uh, the my input signal is D. My order P is eight here, and then the default hop is 128 points, and the window length is 256 points. So that's, it just takes 256-point windows, overlaps them by 50%, windows them, and does the solution. And then it gives us three outputs. A is the, um, <clears throat> is the set of the denominator coefficients, 1, and then minus you know, the AKs. G is the gain. So actually, when we whitened the signal, we got something which was approximately white, but we don't actually know what its actual energy, we didn't record what its energy is. So G is uh, an array of the actual energy of each, of the residual of each frame. And then E is actually the residual itself, which is sort of overlap adds. Um, so one, then we can reconstruct a signal by taking these parameters here. Um, and so there's another function, LPC synth, which just takes the A's, the, the frames of... Um, the filters and the G's, the energies of each of those frames, and then resynthesizes them using a, a white noise sequence. And so if we listen to this... Cottage cheese with jazz is delicious. The experience is meant to be that you can actually understand what's being said. right? So the, vo the, the linguistic information has been preserved, but quite a lot has been taken out. In particular, the, the pitch has been taken out because... The formants are picking out these broad resonances, but they're not able to pick out the fine structure, the individual harmonics, so we no longer hear the pitch. So if we look at this in the spectrogram domain, if we look at the spectrograms of these, if we do the spectrogram of the original one... Okay, so this is a, 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 a narrowband spectrogram of this voice, and so you can see these individual stripes, which are the harmonics here. And if we look at the... Uh, the spectrogram of the noise excited reconstruction. Okay, so this is the, the reconstruction we just heard. And sort of you see it's got the same, it's got these same kind of basic, it's got the same energy modulation, it's got the same concentrations of energy, but they're kind of broader because now they're just these kind of, you know, these resonances with noise underneath and they're moving around, you know, on these. 256 point frame, so 256 on 8 kilohertz is 32 millisecond frames, so it changes every 30 milliseconds, so it changes smoothly enough, but, but it doesn't have enough detail to reconstruct the original signal. Now, that was um, using noise as excitation. We can also take this E residual that we got from the original, and we can um, resynthesize based on that. I think it's the third argument. Let's just have a look. Help. LPC synth. So yeah, it takes the A's, the G's, the E's, and then it has the same hop size and an overlap flag, which I won't tell you about. So if I do um, R E LPC synth of A, G, and then the E, the residual is instead of instead of white noise, now this basically sounds the same. Cottage cheese with jazz. Because I, let, I took the actual, the, the proper residual, and just refiltered it. But what does this E signal look like? Well, if we, so the E should be kind of the difference between this, what's in here, and what's in here. It should be all the fine structure. So if we look at a spectrogram, 
Oops. So that's the, the reconstruction, and then down here. This is the, the spectrogram of E, and so you can see it's been whitened, that the whole thing is flat. I don't know how well you can see what's actually going on there. <clears throat> Maybe if I plot it bigger, you'll be able to see what's going on. That's kind of all en uniform energy across all frequency, but you see these individual stripes in here, which is the fine structure that wasn't captured by the spectrum. So if we listen to this, we can actually play it back. So it's been turned into this kind of noisy broadband signal, <clears throat> but all the stuff that was missing in the noise, in the noise excitation, basically the pitch, and the distinction between pitch and unpitched, is still there. And the amazing thing is, that's not... That's not a very intelligible signal. But compared to nothing, you can actually, you can make, you know, in, in, in tests, people can make some sense of that, that even though the spectrum's been flattened, people still can hear cues to where the formants were, and so there's some, there's some degree of, of residual intelligibility in that signal. But anyway, that gives you a very nice, um, again, acoustic intuition about what's going on in terms of of the uh, of this LPC process and the separation between source and filter. Okay. Yeah. The what? The. Right, right. So, and the, what is the unmost value? Yeah, yeah. Um, but although the sound signal was whatever length it was, I'm breaking it up into these 256 point windows, so whatever. Like, I'm breaking it up in short windows. They, the, the one we saw before was like 400 points long. You want it to be. You want the, the length of the window is basically the, the length of time over which you're assuming that the filter is stationary. So it's about how rapidly the, the vocal track, the resonances you're trying to model, how rapidly they, they vary. If they vary very slowly, you can use a long window, you can get a very stable estimate of what the filter is, and you can you know, have a very high compression ratio. But it turns out to, to, for speech to work well, you don't want to uh, make the filter stationary for more than a few tens of milliseconds. So 30 milliseconds is a good time window for for uh, estimating that. And then, of course, you can carry on doing those 30 millisecond frames forever. So the actual, the A matrix that I looked at was nine columns, which is, you know, the eighth order all-pole all filter. It was like 217 rows, which is the number of time frames I had in that, in that signal. And that can be as long as you like. So this is just summarizing what's going on. We took a signal, we took a little 30 millisecond frame, which was like, you know, this slice of the spectrogram here. We took that time window, we did the water correlation solution, we ended up with this all pole filter, which corresponds to this like this nice smooth frequency response pole, bunch of pole frequency response. Each one of these poles here corresponds to a particular peak in this response because that's when the ether J omega is close to a pole here. What we can do then is actually, you know, first order say, well the frequency, the angles of these poles are the, the center frequencies of these resonances, and just plot those angles on top of the spectrogram. And this gives us a pretty reasonable uh, first order of approximation to the, the format, format tracking. So that here, you know, we've got these, this low format here and these two formats in the middle, and we find that the LPC poles give us a nice, pretty smooth approximation. I mean, every frame is being estimated individually, so there's no um, enforcing of continuity of where these poles lie up. And so during these noisy parts, <coughs> like this is kind of noisy, they, they jump around a fair bit. But during the vowels, they actually are fairly continuous and it's, it's pretty effective. You can use, you can actually take these, find, try and sort of thread them together and use them as curve, 
as the coefficients for a sinusoidal model. Which, so then you'd be representing the speech not with the actual pitch, but with a set of uh, like four sinusoids which just carrying the, the formants. And it turns out that that is also intelligible. It sounds very weird. It sounds like these whistles. But you can still figure out what someone's saying. And there's been quite a lot of research done on the perceptual properties of that. And there's some stuff on my website about that. OK, so that's the basic idea of LPC modeling. This is, this is exactly what it is. We basically take this speech and we represent it as a set of these short time resonances, sequence of these, and then some kind of, that's the filter part for the source filter model. We have to then represent the, the source somehow. And there are various ways we can do that, um, you know, various levels of approximation of the, of the residual signal. But that's the, uh, that's the powerful part. Um, the LPC filter, we can think about it as diff in multiple different ways. I mean, the one, it's, a, it's just this incredibly rich way of thinking about signals because there are so many different interpretations. So we thought about, we, we're describing it in terms of the voice as picking out these resonances, these formants, or, you know, for a, lots of mechanical systems have resonances. So like a, a trumpet or a violin has resonances coming from the actual instrument body, and you can use that. And rooms have resonances coming from reflections. You can use LPC to pick out these as well. You can think of it as just, it's just a smooth, smooth approximation of the spectrum. That we've got this constrained space of representing spectrums as a set of poles, and so it just finds the, the best representation in this constrained, intrinsically smooth space. So it's just a way of getting a, a low-order approximation. There are other ways of doing low-order approximations. You could take the spectrum, you know, this very, very complicated, rig wriggly signal, and you could low-pass filter it, which would be taking a few Fourier components and just trying to approximate it with that. This is actually a different approximation because those, those poles can actually be quite sharp in, in, in their spectrum. And so they're kind of, it's, 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 it's different from our normal way of thinking of, well, you take a, you, you approximate a signal just by smoothing it out. Um, and it turns out that it's actually, in some, in some cases, it's a nicer, it's a more effective way of using a few parameters. And then there's this idea of whitening where we take the smooth, this low order approximation and we sort of take it out, we divide it out to give us this flattened, whitened, or unsmooth version of the spectrum. So that's uh, one way of thinking about what we're doing. We're just sort of uh, removing the smooth part. And then what that means, because we end up with a signal that's flat, that's making it into a white, something that's, that's as close as we can get to a white noise, which means we're we're moving as much as possible the statistical predictability of the signal. We're making it as close as possible to an IID signal, which is what you want for, for compression. So one, one scheme, a lossless compression scheme, is to take, do this kind of thing, to take the, uh, the LPC filter out. You're then left with something that looks kind of like white noise, and you use a, a high-efficiency uh, signal compressor here, like uh, Huffman Coda, which is just a way of, you know, uh, representing each sample with a number of bits that's approximately equal to its uh, statistical likelihood. And so, um, you know, some of these audio code, lossless audio coding schemes like FLAC, that's what they do. They're basically just IIR, LPC, and then Huffman coding for the residual. And you can get, you know, you can get a factor of two or three out of a regular audio signal by doing that with no, no loss of information. Um, because the, the filter is just a, a, a filter, you know, it's like this thing, it's this absolutely bread and butter DSP entity. There are a lot of different ways of describing it. The AKs are, you know, literally the coefficients of, a, of this feedback structure, but lots of other ways of building f filters. You can directly represent it as the poles on the Z plane, which is basically taking this polynomial and factoring it, finding its roots. You can have these lattice filters, which are these nice filters. The problem with you know, the, the direct implementation of an IR filter is you end up representing these roots as these coefficients, but these things are critical. That if you get these things are often very close to one, right? You've got maybe you've got poles close to the inner circle, and that distance in the inner circle you know, it's, whether it's 0.999 or 0.9999 is a huge difference, but 
you know, but that quantization doesn't fit, it doesn't come out very nicely here. So you have these uh, reflection coefficients, which is a different kind of filter, and in that in that representation, the pole positions are much more nicely preserved in the in the co in the coefficients. There are these things called line spectral frequencies, which is basically taking these omegas and directly encoding the filters as a set of frequencies. You don't you don't actually encode the um, magnitudes at all. And you have two sets of interleaved frequencies, and then it's the spacing between the frequencies that intrinsically gives you these um, uh, magnitudes. It's, it's, if you look at the math, it's just a manipulation of the, of the filters. But it just, it's, you manipulate them in such a way that you actually force all the poles to fall in the unit circle. Then you have the actual filter come as the sum and difference of these two filters, these two sets of poles in the unit circle. And then all you have to encode is the frequencies, and they have very nice properties for quantization. They're sort of uniformly distributed, so you can have a quantizer which is very efficient. And then it just depends on the, the application, which of these is the, the best one to do. Um, okay, so we're sort of running out of time here. There's this nice stuff you can do when you actually got this representation in terms of these filters, and you can do this warping of the filters directly in the in the, in the filter domain. We talked about this briefly last semester in terms of these uh, warping of filters that you can take the center frequencies and by putting, replacing the delays with a simple all-pass filter, you end up with a filter that has the same magnitude response but the frequencies are shifted up or down. And you can, um, you can get these effects where you warp, warp the effects. And so there's a, there's a link here where you can See some MATLAB code lets you play with this because it's kind of an interesting effect. You can, for voice, you can make it so that you keep the the speech and the pitch, but it sounds like the sort of the size of the person is changing. You can change, you know, make it sound very kind of squeaky and like it's coming from a little chipmunk or something, without without speeding up the pitch. Um, oops, here's the example. So I guess that's the original speech, and then this is warped. Right, so it sounds kind of unnatural, but it, the pitch is still the same. And so um, another thing we can do, which is what we're going to be playing with on Wednesday, is um, we can take, we can separate any signal up into its source and its filter. And the source is like, you know, the fine structure of the spectrum, the filter is the broad structure. We can then do this for two signals, and then we can do cross synthesis, where we take the, the source for one signal and feed it into the filter for a different signal, and suddenly we've got this sound, which is the composite of the, the sort of the, the fine structure properties, the pitch and temporal structure of, of one signal, and the broad spectral properties, the, the resonances of the other signal. And so in particular, if this is, if the resonances come from speech, but the source comes from something else, you can end up with signals that sound like, that preserve the, the message, the, the speech signal, but they're with some other kind of character. See, so this, is, this is the classic vocoder thing where you can make your electric guitar or whatever sound like it, it's speaking. That's what we're going to play with. I guess we don't have time to look at this now, but it's all up on, on the website. If you want to take a look at it, you can just you can run this thing straight off. It just, it's a, you open the patch, and it lets you load in a source and excitation, and then it performs the cross-synthesis. So we can, uh, we can look at that. So any, uh, any questions about that? So hopefully when we actually play with this on Wednesday, you'll get a feeling for you know, the power and utility of this approach. All right, I'll see you on Wednesday.